time to start our session. Can you hear me in the back? Good. So I have the privilege of introducing the first speaker, Jens Markloff. He was born in Munich. He studies in Germany and currently is a professor of mathematical physics at the University of Bristol in the UK. He's a well-known expert in quantum chaos, dynamical systems, number theory. Uh, I just found out that he is the recipient of several awards, including more recently the Whitehead Prize at the London Mathematical Society. And today he's going to speak on. Please, Jens. Thank you. Approximately 150 years ago, Maxwell and Boltzmann formulated revolutionary ideas on how to derive the laws of thermodynamics from Newton's equation of motions of the, under, of the uh, elementary particles, <coughs> atoms and molecules. At the time, these ideas were highly controversial because many people didn't believe that matter would be constituted of elementary particles. And Boltzmann was often ridiculed for these ideas. Today, of course, we accept the hypothesis, but you might find it surprising that we still don't have a rigorous understanding of the key step in Boltzmann's approach, which is the derivation of the Boltzmann equation um, from Newton's laws for Boltzmann's hard sphere gas. So today, uh, I, will talk a much, I will talk about a much simpler model, and that is the Lorentz gas, which uh, Lorentz proposed in the early 20th century to model um, <coughs> electrons in metal. Of course, at the time, quantum theory wasn't developed fully, so this is pre-quantum mechanics, and I will, throughout this talk, only talk about classical mechanics. And so, what is the Lorentz gas? Um, here, we consider point particles that move in an array of spherical scatterers. Here are my spherical scatterers, the blue dots. And here I have two particles that follow their trajectory, which we assume here is in between scattering events, motion along straight lines with constant speed. <coughs> and once they hit one of the scatterers, they are elastically reflected or follow some other law. Well, I come to that in a minute. Um, the key point here is that in kinetic theory, we're interested in uh, the limit of a dilute gas that was Boltzmann's assumption. So that means we look at the low density limit. Now here we assume that the particles don't interact with each other, so they don't see each other. That's a huge simplification, of course. They just interact with the scatterers. And the low density limit here, as we will see, refers to low density of scatterers. Now here's the precise setting. So we assume that the locations of our scatterers are given by some point set, P, that has unit density, though that simply means that you count the number of uh, points in a large ball that should be approximately the volume of the ball. Um, scatterers have radius R, particles are assumed to be non-interacting, as I said, and we will move with unit speed between collisions. So, Without loss of generality, we may therefore assume that the speed is 1. Everything else follows from a simple scaling argument. So that will be our standing assumption for the rest of this talk. Examples for scatterer configurations that I will discuss in this lecture will be, for example, uh, scatterers given by a realization of a Poisson point process, first example. That would be what I call a random scatterer configuration. Uh, another example is the perfect crystal. So that means the scatterers sit on the points of a Euclidean lattice. And the third example will be the vertex set of a Penrose tiling, or more generally a quasi-crystal. 
Um, of course, there are many other point configurations, and what I'm trying to illustrate today to you is a general program on how to try to understand the dynamics of the Lorentz gas in the low density limit for a general, a general point configuration of this type. It's traditional in dynamical systems and the, to, to consider the Lorentz gas but for fixed radius and you know that uh, it was one of the key models in dynamics <coughs> to find and study uh, diffusion Bunimovic and Sinai used it uh, uh, first to, to prove a central limit theorem in the system um, uh, and that was followed later on <coughs> in the case of so-called infinite horizon Lorentz gas by Blecher, Zas, Bayo and Dolgopiat and Chernoff. Now, as we are interested in the low density limit, as you will see, this is very, very different because we are changing our dynamical system. We are making the scatterer smaller and smaller to achieve that low density limit. While in the classical setting of dynamical systems, of course, you fix your dynamical system and you look at the long time limit. So, here is what happens when a particle hits a scatterer. It's given by a general scattering map. We assume our scatterer is spherically symmetric. <coughs> so, for instance, you could imagine um, the scattering given by a potential that's spherically symmetric, um, such as a <coughs> truncated Coulomb potential. We shoot in with an incoming velocity, B here will be the so-called impact parameter, theta is the scattering angle, and S is the outgoing parameter, E out the outgoing velocity. So that's classical, classical notion in scattering theory. And what we assume of our scattering map here is that it's nicely diffusive. So <coughs> Um, we either assume that the scattering angle is a strictly decreasing function of the impact parameter or a strictly increasing function. And here's a caricature of what happens uh, in, in the situation A when it's strictly increasing. So the key, uh, the, the important point is basically that you hit your uh, particle with a parallel uh, uh, ray of, of incoming particles that the outgoing velocities um, spread out in this nice way so that you uh, have a nice convertible map uh, for, your, for your velocities. Uh, two examples of such a scattering map is the classical setting of Lorentz where you uh, have elastic reflection and this is the law for the scattering angle here. <coughs> and another one is uh, a famous potential that's used a lot in solid state physics which is a Coulomb potential but it's truncated um, at a finite radius. So both of these satisfy uh, the assumptions in the previous slide. Okay, now, as I said, we are here interested in the low density limit, which is also known as the boltzmann grad limit. And here, we shrink the scatterers while keeping their position fixed. I'm going to call Q and V <coughs> microscopic phase space coordinates of time t. And you can easily imagine that when you shrink your scatterers, it'll take you longer and longer to hit the scatterer. And a simple dimensional argument tells you that the mean free path length scales exactly like 1 over the cross section of the scatterer. The cross section is the area that the particle sees when it hits a scatterer. And the dimension of that cross-section is r to the d minus 1. So, if we want to recover anything useful in the low density limit, we have to rescale our units of length and time. And we do this by rescaling our length and time unit exactly by the mean free path lengths and the mean collision time, which scales like this. So we introduce new macroscopic coordinates, capital Q and capital B, 
that are related to our microscopic coordinates in this way. If we rescale time by too little, we won't see anything. The particle will eventually never hit anything. Okay? So this is really crucial. And this particular scaling is just the critical scaling where the particle will just hit something. Of course, you could also look at longer times. And that's a very, very interesting question. <coughs> the time evolution for some initial particle position and velocity is then given by a flow, oops, uh, phi tr, um, and it is r dependent, and that is, is crucial here. And so what we think about now is we think of an initial particle cloud that's given by some L1 density f in our unit tangent bundle or in our phase space, um, and we want to know what does it do at time t in these macroscopic coordinates. Okay. So, and the time evolution, of course, is simply defined by applying your flow up to time t. You apply the inverse flow, of course, because we're evolving densities here. And now, what is the key question? That's the question that Boltzmann asked for his Boltzmann gas, and that's the question that Lorentz asked for his Lorentz gas, is, is there a sensible limit? Does this density in those units converge to something? First of all, does it converge at all? And if it converges, does it converge to something interesting? And what Lorentz found, following the, following the heuristics of Boltzmann, is that <coughs> you would expect it to converge something, and that something it will be a solution, Ft, of the so-called <coughs> linear Boltzmann equation. The equation here is linear because we have removed the interaction between our particles. Boltzmann equation, of course, is nonlinear, which makes it much more difficult to track. This is a linear equation, differential integral equation, and to, um, for you who have, haven't seen such an equation before, just think of the right-hand side being zero, then your particle cloud will just evolve freely, and you can easily see that the solution of this equation with the right-hand side being zero is exactly just the classical <coughs> uh, equation, and so our density will just uh, move with constant speed. The right-hand side is the so-called collision integral, which tells you um, how the velo velocities of our particle cloud in this low density limit are related before and after the velocity. And you can think of this differential cross-section here as a conditional probability that tells you, given my incoming velocity is b prime, what's the probability that the particle exits um, with velocity v? <coughs> Here's an example of such a differential cross-section for our elastic reflection. Now, this equation is very, very popular in many areas and has been proved extremely useful, even though it is in the low density limit. But for instance, in neutron transport or radiative transfer, this limit seems to accurately describe the phenomena that people see. So it is an important equation. Lorentz's arguments were heuristic, and you could ask, have we got a rigorous proof for precisely this convergence? And the first proof was given by Galavotti in the late 60s in a famous paper. Um, where he assumed that the scatterers are um, Poisson distributed, so the centers are a realization of a Poisson process, and he uh, proved convergence and probability. Um, this was later uh, improved by a paper by Boldrigini, Bonimovic, and Sinai, who showed that actually we have the convergence for a fixed realization of the Poisson process. And that's a very, very beautiful paper. I recommend it to you. It uses basically very nice but powerful methods from probability theory. Um, Spohn also pointed out that it doesn't necessarily have to be a Poisson configuration as long as you have sufficient decay of correlations between the positions of scattering. 
Um, I should also mention that people have investigated the analog uh, quantum system, but I'm not going to talk about this today. Anybody who's interested should look uh, at, these, at these papers down on the bottom. Now, the key assumption in all these papers was that the scatter configuration should be completely random. What about non-random scattering configurations? For example, the periodic Lorentz gas. So here is a character again of our particle starting at this position and having three different initial velocities and we ask exactly the same question as before. We shrink the scatterers uh, and ask, do we have a sensible time evolution in the boltzmann brad limit? Eight years ago, um, in the ICM 2006 in Madrid, Golza pointed out that the linear Boltzmann equation fails to describe the Boltzmann work limit. And why is that so? His argument was based on the observation in a paper by Bogan, Golza, and Benberg that the distribution of free path lengths, so the free path lengths is the free flight time between uh, to scattering events, has a heavy tail. It goes down like t to the minus 2. Uh, so the density goes like t to the minus 3. And that is not consistent with the linear Boltzmann equation. It's a very beautiful, simple argument that he used. So what about then the, the, the question of, does it converge to anything else? And that's what I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> First of all, uh, the result by Bogan, Golza, and Benberg was improved later on by Boca and Zaharesco, who proved that in two dimensions there is actually a limit distribution for the free path lengths and the Boltzmann Brad limit. Um, and they found an explicit formula for this, which clearly shows the heavy tail of the distribution. And in more recent work with uh, Andreas Strombergson, we showed that in fact the path length distribution exists in any dimension, um, and I'm going to tell you why, how, how, we, how, we, how we did this, and we have an exact asymptotic tail uh, for the density of the free path length distribution. Note that this power, 1 of the uh, uh, 1 over t cubed implies that the path length distribution doesn't have even a second moment, and that will have quite dramatic consequences um, for our limiting process. We don't have a formula, an explicit formula, as we have in two dimensions for higher dimensions, but we do have a formula that we can integrate numerically, and on the right hand side you see the numerical graph for this distribution. So it's a beautiful distribution, and what is even more beautiful is that this distribution comes from a random variable that lives on the space of lattices, a very uh, important uh, uh, probability space that um, uh, we've seen in, in, in a number of, of, uh, of talks already in this conference. Okay, <clears throat> our theory with Andreas Strombergson doesn't only allow us to calculate the <coughs> limit distribution for the free path lengths, but actually completely answer the question whether the dynamics converges to something. And this is what's stated here in this theorem. So remember, we're interested in the uh, time evolution of an initial density up to time f. And what this theorem says is, that indeed there exists a limiting operator LT of F that describes the evolution in the limit. What is very surprising, was surprising to us in the beginning, is that this family of operators LT that describe the limit don't form a semigroup. Now the LTR for each fixed are form a semigroup, but this property is lost in, the, in this weak limit. And that's maybe surprising to you, there is a deep reason for this. And this deep reason is that in this weak limit we lose information and we have to keep track of that to preserve our <coughs> semigroup. 
This is achieved by not only considering position and velocity, but additional variables that you might think of hidden variables, which is the flight time until the next scatterer and the velocity after the next hit. And if you keep track of those particles, which of course in the Newtonian dynamics depend on Q and V, because once you know your, your position and velocity of the particle, you know the evolution until infinity. And so Xi and V plus are determined by Q and V. But no longer in the boltzmann grad limit. They become independent random variables of those. They don't become independent, but they're given by a joint density. And if you keep track of those, so we now consider a density not only in Q and V, but in these additional variables, and we obtain in the limit a generalized Boltzmann equation that has a similar form, but it needs to take into account uh, of these additional variables. So we have a d mi uh, minus d by d xi here, because of course the time until the next collision decreases, and this is a generalized collision kernel, or maybe more appropriate, a transport transport kernel. And you get back to the thing that you're interested in by simply projecting out those auxiliary variables and the initial condition you need to choose for this generalized Boltzmann equation uh, of this form, so that's your initial particle density and you multiply it by the stationary solution of the generalized Boltzmann equation. So if you plug in this initial condition you find the solution that will give you your particle density in the low density limit at time t. You can now ask, well, and what happens in the long time limit of this uh, evolution? And in a very recent paper by, uh, with um, uh, Bob and Tort, um, we've shown that um, the long time dynamics of the particle density satisfies a central limit theorem, which means that the particle density essentially becomes Gaussian. But what is very uh, <coughs> beautiful here is that it's not a standard central limit theorem, uh, where you normalize by square root t, but you have to normalize by square root t log t. In other words, the mean square grows not linearly, as in the standard central limit theorem, but as t log t. So we have super diffusion in this case. And the reason is that uh, long flight times are slightly more probable. And why is this? Well, remember, the free path length distribution has a heavy tail and no second moment. So that's really behind this super diffusion. But of course, you need to prove a lot more to get to the central limit theorem. In this observation. But that is basically the effect that we are here in this particular domain of attraction, non standard domain of attraction for the central limit theorem. I won't tell you anything about the proof, I just wanted to let you know that we've proved it. We are very proud of this result because it's the first result for the Lorentz gas in any dimension greater than two. Two dimensions, this result is already known when you fix your scattering radius, but for fixed are there is no proof in any dimension greater than 2. <clears throat> right. Now, the theorem that establishes that there is a generalized linear Boltzmann equation that describes your dynamics <coughs> in the low density limit. Um, here is the key ingredient of the proof. And that is basically to look at the first n segments of your flight path. Each of these will roughly have length 1. And, um, sorry, I shouldn't say roughly have length 1. They'll, they'll be random variables um, that fluctuate on the order of unity, and that's because we've rescaled all our length units so that the mean free path length is now fixed, basically 1. So, in a finite time interval, we expect to have finitely many collisions. And so, let's just look at the first n collisions, and therefore let's look at the first n segments of our flight. This is S1 up to Sn. So, 
they are functions for each fixed R of the initial data. S1 up to Sn are functions of this. What this theorem tells you is that if you throw your initial data at random with respect to some probability measure, and that probability measure will be determined by our initial particle density, um, we get a limit. And this limit has this density psi n lambda, and this density here has the key property that it factorizes. What does that mean? Well, it means that our, the legs of our journey are generated by a Markov process with memory 2. Because uh, if you want to know the distribution of the jth element, the jth leg of our journey, you only need to condition on the previous 2. Right? That's, that, that's what this formula says. And so this is really good news. Uh, in the original Hamiltonian dynamics, of course, everything just depends on the first, so there are strong correlations. Here, things decouple, and we get a Markov process with memory 2. That's the key ingredient in the proof. And once you have this, you can just use standard techniques from the theory of Markov processes to uh, derive the generalized linear Boltzmann equation that you've seen as the fokker plum kolmogorov equation of the Markov process that you get by flowing with unit speed along those uh, um, paths that are generated by our discrete Markov chain with memory 2. Now, and that means theorem A that I've shown you follows from, from this observation. Uh, of course, there are many technical estimates that you have to do. To, to make this, you have to uh, actually you know, justify that we, uh, we can truncate this for a finite n, but this can all be done. Now, I won't be able to, of course, explain to you how this proof works in this limited time, but what I can do is give you a glimpse of uh, what the proof is about. And in order to do this, let me just prove this theorem that we had here uh, in the case little n equal to 1. Okay, so I'm only interested in the first leg of our journey. Okay, so the direction is already determined because that's the direction which we shoot off. Um, and what we're interested in is when will this particle hit the first scatterer? Because that will determine the length of the vector as well. So that's nothing but the distribution of free path lengths. And if you want to then go to the full proof of this theorem, what you need to keep track of is exactly where this particle hits. Well, that's kind of a subtle thing, because then you know how it's reflecting. And then once you know how it's reflecting, you want to know when it hits the next scatterer and where it hits again, and so on. So you keep on iterating this argument. And that again is uh, another 70-page paper, the second step. So I'm now going to talk about the first step, um, but the 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 all the key ideas are in this first step already. So when we had this first step, we knew we could do the rest. It would, we would suffer, but we could do it. So. so how does this work? Now, in order to explain this to you, I need to introduce um, the space of lattices. A lattice here, I mean Euclidean lattices. So L, we will denote the Euclidean lattice of covolume 1. That means the fundamental domain under the L action on RD has volume 1. Each such Euclidean lattice can be uh, written as your standard cubic lattice ZD times a matrix M in SLDR. I, I act from the right here because I think of Z or RD as being written in terms of row vectors. And every such lattice can be obtained in this way and therefore you can write you can parametrize the space of Euclidean lattices of cobol in 1 as this quotient. Uh, note that SLDZ is just the, the stabilizer of ZD. So when you apply a SLDZ matrix, a matrix with integer coefficients of cobol, uh, 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 determinant 1, uh, ZD is invariant, and you can actually show that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between SLDR modulo SLDZ and the Euclidean lattices of cobol in one. 
What is more, as Minkowski showed us, is that <coughs> in fact this space of lattices carries a finite measure. <coughs> and not only it's a finite measure, but it's SLDR invariant finite measure, and that means we can normalize it to make it a probability measure. That measure is just Harm measure on SLDR projected on that portion space. And that is key in, in what we're going to do here. Right. Um, we also need the notion of an uh, affine, a space of affine lattices. So that just means we also allow our lattices to be shifted. And why is that? Well, we're going to shoot off our particle not necessarily from the origin, but from a generic point in RD, and that's why we also need to include shifts. <coughs> and you can do the same construction here, um, where you uh, include translations, uh, and not just volume-preserving linear transformations, and form the semi-direct product group, which I call ASL, for affine special idea. Uh, and similar here, similarly here, you can realize um, the space of affine lattices as a portion of SLD R uh, by SLDZ and mu, mu here will be the uh, unique right SLDR invariant probability measure on X in the space of affine lattices. Okay, now here is the statement of the, uh, the of the convergence of the distribution of free path lengths to a limit um, as we shrink our scatters. And then I'm <coughs> going to show you why, why this statement is true. Okay, so tau 1, just to fix notation here, is the mean free path lengths corresponding to some initial data Q and B. I'm now looking again in the microscopic framework, so Q and B are actually uh, the microscopic coordinates and so is tau, so we now have to rescale everything, as you remember by this factor r to the d minus 1, which is exactly one of the mean free path lengths. And I'm doing this because we can be a little more ambitious here. We don't need to throw q at random, but we can fix it. So we fix q, and we only take the velocity to be random. Okay? So you sit somewhere and you shoot your particle off in a random direction. This random direction is determined by a probability measure on your sphere of directions, lambda, and all we uh, assume is that this probability measure is absolutely continuous with respect to the back measure on the sphere. The, problem, the, the theorem is already new and hard enough if you assume <coughs> lambda to be the uniform measure on the sphere. Okay? So that's, um, that's what you can keep in mind. But of course, we want that measure to not only be uniform, because we might want to shoot the particle off in a particular uh, direction. And so what does this theorem say? Well, it says that the limit distribution exists, calling this FL0Q. Q is fixed, L0 is fixed, that's our lattice. It's continuous in psi, independent of lambda, and we have a formula for it, and here it is. Okay, so what do we see? Well. First of all, uh, if, Q, if you shoot off from a lattice point, then the probability of hitting the first scatterer after time uh, xi, rescale time xi, is the same as the probability that a random lattice does not intersect this cylinder here. And if we shoot off from a generic position, and by generic here I simply mean that that point should not be a rational multiple of a lattice vector. So <coughs> almost all points satisfy this. Yeah, of course. Um, then the limit distribution for the free path lengths is given by the probability that a random affine lattice doesn't intersect that same cylinder. Okay? Note the cylinder depends on xi, of course. So that's the dependence <coughs> here. But everything else is independent of Q and L0. So that's quite remarkable. So if you have uh, the standard cubic lattice or a tilted lattice, it doesn't matter. It's also independent on, of the direction that you shoot off. Right? So if you rotate your lattice, you get the same answer. Now how do we prove that theorem? That's what I want to illustrate to you. So what's the question here? Well, we have, and I'm going to look at the special case when Q is zero, 
And just for the presentation here, I've chosen our standard cubic lattice. So we shoot off a particle in a certain direction. This is the direction. And we want to understand the probability, or if you prefer, the measure of directions with respect to lambda, so that this ray doesn't intersect any sphere. Okay, that's clearly not the case here, but you could imagine that if you shoot it off here, you'll find something. Um, so that's the, that's the problem. Now you can rephrase that problem in, in terms of a lattice point counting problem. Um, it's approximately equivalent to asking the question that this long and thin cylinder doesn't contain any lattice point. The width of the cylinder is exactly the diameter of our scatterers, and the length is the length of the ray that we're looking at. And it's approximately because this cylinder should really have spherical caps. But that's the only approximation. These are tiny, and you can prove that you can neglect that. Now we're going to do something very, very simple. We're going to rotate this picture uh, so that the velocity is now horizontal. And then we are going to uh, apply a linear transformation, which is given by this diagonal matrix, which shrinks the first coordinate and expands all other coordinates by these factors, so that you end up with this picture. So now, the object in which we want to count points is a R-independent object and the independent object. Okay, that's the key. That's why we've done this, of course, what I've done here is true. The price we pay is that we have changed our lattice. It's no longer the cubic lattice, it's some other lattice. And what have I done? I have introduced a dynamics on the space of lattices. You can call this a renormalization if you like, but Misha Lubitz is in the audience, so I shouldn't. Because it's slightly different, and in fact, I haven't approximated anything except removing these caps from this number. But I think of it a little bit in this way, because uh, I've replaced the problem now by a different problem, where my <coughs> cylinder is no longer long and thin, but fixed. And what we want to prove, if you remember, is we want to show that the probability that this cylinder has no point in it has a limit. Okay. So, it's still the same question. We want to show that this cylinder has no point in it for a random <coughs> v and r tending to zero. And how can we prove this? Well, um, think of the new lattice that we got here, the one up there, still as a random lattice. So, v is random and r is small. And what, what we can show is that this random lattice converges in the sense of convergence of random point processes to a random lattice in the space of lattices that I had defined, where random now means with respect to the Haar measure mu1, <coughs> our probability measure mu1. And that convergence follows from this equidistribution theorem that I've stated here, which tells you that these averages over v so remember, KV was the rotation matrix that put our frame uh, so that the velocity is now horizontal. Okay? And so you can think of this as a spherical average that's transported by this matrix dr, which you can identify with a flow, like a geodesic flow. And what this theorem tells you is that we have uniform distribution of large spheres. And this follows from uh, the mixing property of this flow from harmonic analysis, if you like, or uh, another proof, uh, you could simply use Ratner's theorem. But this really only requires the mixing property. Um, if you want to uh, prove uh, the, the, the same statement for Q non-zero, then you in fact need to apply Ratner's machinery, and in particular we use a beautiful uh, corollary, corollary of, of Radner's theorem by Bani Michel. But what I want you to take home from what I've just said is that we apply an equidistribution theorems, uh, an equidistribution theorem here to show that our randomly rotated and stretched lattice converges to a random lattice with respect to Haar measure. Okay, so that's the the message of this first part, and that is sort of the key, the key ingredient.
Um, now, there are, of course, now the question is, and that's what my research now and future research is, is about, together with, with Andreas Strömbergson, is to replace uh, the letters by a general scatterer configuration. And we've carried out two case studies. One is um, the question when you have, for instance, unions of lattices. And here we simply take these unions. Um, we assume that the letters are incommensurate in a certain sense. And what you can prove then is that, again, you get a limiting distribution. And what happens is, very beautiful, the lattices all become independent. Um, and what we need to use here is, so here is the situation. So it's basically the same as before, but now the equidistribution theorem of the large spheres that I showed you is now an equidistribution theorem on a product space, which simply refers to the product of these lattices. So now we work on the nth product of, of the space of lattices. And we apply the same spherical average on each component. And we can show um, this uh, uh, incommensurability assumption that the limit, uh, in the limit, you get the product measure. And a consequence of this is that now the path length distribution doesn't have such a heavy tail anymore. It decays much faster. So that's our first case study. Um, um, and we can also write down the general linear Boltzmann equation, but I don't have time to go into this. The second one is very exciting. You can look at a, another aperiodic scatterer configuration, and that's given, say, uh, by the vertices of a Penrose tiling. And now again, here is the question, um, you know, what do the spherical averages do here? So again, we take our point set, we do exactly the same that we did before, we randomly rotate it and we squash it by this matrix dr. Does that converge to anything? Does that converge to any random point process in the limit? And what is that? It could be the Poisson point process, in which case we would recover the linear Boltzmann equation. Well, here the, the situation is the following. So, these vertices of <coughs> Penrose tiling, for instance, or more general quasi-crystals, can be realized through this cut and project method, where you look at a higher dimensional space, you put a lattice of full rank into this higher dimensional space, you take a certain window set, which you select the lattice point, and you project them down onto your target space, say R2. And here, again, you see a lattice coming up, and so we are in business again. We can apply dynamics on the space of lattices to prove again that the free uh, path length distribution exists and is given by a suitable random variable on what I call or what we call the space of quasi crystals. Again here we really need to use Ratner's theorem because we are applying a low dimensional spherical average. We again use rotations in D dimensions but now in the space of lattices of n dimensions. So this is a very, very thin average. And there's no other way but to use Ratner's famous theorem to, um, to prove anything here. Um, and, and this is the setting. So the averages that we apply here um, play uh, in the, so the playground here is the space of affine lattices in n dimensions. We have an embedding in SLDR in this n-dimensional space, and this embedding is determined on how our uh, lattice, n-dimensional lattice, sits in Rn. <clears throat> and what you want to show is that we have some equidistribution here. And that we can do, but the equidistribution is no longer necessarily in the full space, but it can localize in a subspace. And that's exactly what's <coughs> happening in the case of Penrose time. So that's very exciting for us when we discovered that. And in particular, what happens, and let me just go straight to that here. Uh, if P is the vertex set on the, on the Penrose tiling, the equidistribution of our spherical average is not in the full space, but is in a subspace, which is given by um, SL2R squared modulo a Hilbert modular group. That's related to the 
uh, number field that arises in the construction of this Penrose tiling. And I think no one has observed this before, that you in some sense can rescale Penrose tilings by the Hilbert modular group and put a nice probability measure on that that explains the limit distribution. If we are generic, so if we take a lattice that sits generically in our uh, high dimensional space, then we become equidistributed anywhere in, in the full space. We again see that the free path length distribution has a heavy tail. We haven't completed that work in the Penrose tiling. We're doing that at the moment right now. So in conclusion, the linear Boltzmann equation governs the boltzmann grad limit of the Lorentz gas for typical typical scatterer configurations, but it fails when you have certain long-range correlations. And I've shown you three examples where this can be established. Um, and I've shown you that the way we prove this is by reducing the question to a question of equidistribution in the appropriate moduli spaces. Future challenges. I'd like to understand for a general P scatterer configuration, if we can pull, push this whole program through and find the corresponding SLDR invariant limit processes. All the examples I showed you were SLDR invariant limit point processes. Lorentz gas and force fields is an interesting question. Other scaling limits, and of course the quantum version. So, my time's up. I would like to thank you, the organizers, for inviting me. Great uh, venue and a great conference. So a particular thank you from me to our Korean hosts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions, comments? Um, please. I don't have any question, but instead of me, I'm just curious why is Gaussian test? Is what? Why, why Gaussian test appears there? Ah, okay, so Could you this, please repeat the yeah, question? so the question is why in the central limit theorem, the theorem with Ball and Todt, um, we have a Gaussian density in the limit, and that is because we now look at the long time limit of our uh, random uh, Markov process, and there are decorrelations. <coughs> so segments, or flight segments that are far apart don't no longer know something about each other. It's a Markov process with finite memory, and that's really behind that. But it's a very subtle problem here because we're in the non-standard domain of attraction. Okay, so you need to prove something to show that. Please. You mentioned a Markov process with memory two. Yeah. Memory two. Why it is two? Uh, the two is because when you look at this problem. Uh, you, you exit from one scatterer. I've prepared this because I get this question asked all the time. Uh, so we've just hit the scatterer, and now we want to understand what the probability of having, hitting the next scatterer uh, after a certain time. What we can show is that, in fact, this probability uh, is independent of... It, of course, depends on where we were coming from, because that determines this probability, but. Uh, once you condition on the exit parameter here, it only depends on the exit parameter and not the previous velocity. Okay, so the probability only depends on where you exit, how long you fly, and where you hit. And that's all. And that needs to be proved, but that's what we prove. And that explains the memory too. If there would be more memory, if the scatterer wouldn't be so nicely diffuse, if you would get more memory. Any more questions? Before we thank the speaker again, I have the task of giving you a little gift from our Korean colleagues. Thank you. So we'll resume at 10 past 4.